morning, good morning. We'll open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, so much for all the help you give us and help me, Lord, to uh, uh, present your word in a way that's uh, glorifying to you and, uh, and that I uh, understand it correctly and help me to understand it in a way that's honoring to you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. Okay, well, winding down. I think I'll probably take most of the week uh, to finish up. So I had mentioned maybe we'll be doing Exodus by the end of the week, but I'm thinking it's going to be beginning of next week. Uh, I've been uh, working on my notes for chapter 50, and it might turn into two days also. So I'm thinking two more days, uh, possibly, for chapter 49, and then two more days for chapter 50. So we'll see how today goes. <clears throat> So Genesis 49, and we left off, and that, uh, we were talking about uh, Dan, the Danites, and the fact that they established a uh, city up, uh, well, let me get uh, our maps back here. There's the maps. I got a little bit bigger. You see there, you see Dan mentioned. <clears throat> it's a town right here. They established, it used to be called uh, Lashish. So that's where we left off. Now, uh, Dan also has an area. Hmm. That's yeah, easier to see on this map. That's the same dam we were just talking about. And Dan had an area down here too. So what happened was, is it, uh, as I was pointing out yesterday, that part of them wanted to worship, did not want to worship God anymore. They wanted to worship idols. And so they left this area and went north and actually took over this area in Dan and started uh, setting up their own idol worship up there. And that's where I got into that whole idea of the uh, of Bashan. Bashan is in this general area, even though it's part of the tribe of Manasseh. <clears throat> this aid area later on, particularly down and through here, is where Jesus met that, uh, that one guy that had like a thousand uh, demons inside of him, or quite a few hundred, I can't remember the exact number. I think it was, no, I think it was in the thousands because legion is, a uh, legion is a number. They had legions in it and he sent them out into the pigs and the pigs ran down off the hill and killed themselves. That's this, this is that same general area right here next to the, uh, on the other side of the sea. So this is the same area we call Bashan and Jesus commented about them. <laughs> so that's where we left off. So Gad is next. <clears throat> And so we'll try to hit Gad through uh, the end of the chapter, and we'll see how we do. So let's get some verses in here. Okay, here we go. Let's start off there. We're picking back up at, cha at chapter 49, verse 19. For anyone who's following along in their own Bible. Uh, which, by the way, I kind of recommend, uh, I can pause for a minute if you want to go get it, because you never know, you might want to jot a note down inside your Bible on the uh, margin. I know I do it. Uh, I don't, don't do it as much as I wish I had over the years, uh, but that, uh, I'm trying to do it, particularly if there's something really I want to remember the next time I read this particular section. I try to read through my Bible every year. I got a little program. 
been keep track on on track to try to do do the entire Bible each year, which I highly recommend. That's how the Lord talks to us. Okay, verse 19. Gad, a troop shall overcome him. If you remember correctly, what we're doing here is that uh, Jacob is talking to his sons and giving them a uh, little bit of a prophecy of how their tribe is going to uh, make out uh, over the over the centuries. So here's the one for Gad. Gad supplied many fine troops for the latter king of Israel, David. So Gad, a troop, shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. So Gad, it sounds like he's going to be someone that uh, contributes a lot of troops to help out King David. We see that in First Chronicles 12, 8 through 14. Let me just read through that. You know, the Gadonites there separated themselves unto David and to the whole, to the wilderness, men of might and men of war fit for battle that could handle shield and buckler, whose faces were like the faces of lions and were as swift as the rose upon the mountains. Ezekiah the first, Obadiah the second, Eliab the third, Mishamine the fourth, Jeremiah the fifth, Hei the sixth, Eli the seventh, Johan the eighth, Ezebad the ninth, Jeremiah the tenth, don't worry, there's only about a hundred of these. No, I'm only kidding. Maccabini the eleventh. These were the sons of Gad, captains of the host. One of the least was over a hundred, and the greatest over a thousand. Each one of those sons had at least a hundred troops under him, and some over, over a thousand. These are they that went over Jordan in the first month when it had overflown all its banks, and they put to fight, flight all them of the valleys, both toward the east and toward the west. But here they were, uh, they were working for King David and actually uh, uh, getting rid of some of the enemies that were on the other side of the Jordan. And a little comment about this particular section. A troop shall tramp upon him. Uh, when I mentioned there, it goes in first for that a troop shall overcome him. The days of Jeremiah, among other times, foreign armies oppressed Gad. And we see this in Jeremiah 49, 1 and 2. Concerning the Ammonites, saith the Lord, hath Israel no sons, hath he no heir? Why then doth the king inherit Gad, and his people dwell in his cities? Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will cause an alarm of war to be heard in Rabbah of the Ammonites, and shall be a desolate heap, and her daughters shall be burned with fire. Then shall Israel be heir unto them that were his heirs, saith the Lord. That's in this general, same general area. The Ammonites actually controlled this particular area. I probably should have got a map of uh, that. I'm going to find one real quick. More current map. Quickly available, I didn't think about it. Uh, this might have it, but yeah, it does. There's the Amorites in this area. And then there it is. So you can see the uh, right here, just uh, and it's kind of like to, to the uh, east of the uh, of uh, the Dead Sea area is the Dead Sea right there. And so, uh, the, so the Gad, uh, the tribe of Gad is going to help out King uh, David during this time fight against the uh, Ammonites. So that's what it's basically talking about here. Yeah, victory would be his in the end. He shall overcome at the last. And looking back on that verse again, some other things about it. He shall overcome at the last. This has been the blessing of many a child of uh, God to fight, and apparently to lose the battle, yet to win in the end. And something Spurgeon said. So God is going to be really helpful to King David in the end, and so uh, uh, sort of like a good warring uh, type tribe. 
And during these and during these periods of time leading up to the current days, uh, there was lots of different wars going on because people just uh, when King David finally took the throne, uh, Israel was like one of those places where everybody wanted it because of uh, their riches. And particularly when Solomon came on board, uh, he had, uh, it was probably the richest time of Israel's history, including even now. Uh, so, but David was before, uh, just before, about a thousand BC. So, on to the next one. Asher, Asher's next. So let's take a look at Asher. Asher's over here on the coast. He's got the coast. Out of Asher, his bread shall be fat and he shall yield royal dainties. Interesting uh, prophecy. So over in Deuteronomy 33, 24 and 25 also reflects on this. Deuteronomy 33 is actually kind of a similar uh, Moses kind of a, uh, a prophecy uh, of the period of time when Moses was in control of the 12 tribes. So Deuteronomy 23, uh, 33 is almost like, uh, like a, uh, a parallel in some ways, not every one, but uh, with, uh, with the uh, Genesis 49. And of Asher, he said, let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren and let him dip his foot in oil. Oil is almost always talking about riches, of uh, uh, being wealthy. And whenever you talk about oil, it's usually talking about, because it was one of the commodities that uh, uh, was one that wasn't always easy for the poor to get a hold of, particularly really good oils. The shoe shall be iron and brass, and, and as thy day, so shall thy strength be. So a really good report on Asher too. Uh, so he shall yield royal dainties, dainties. Apparently the land eventually occupied by Asher was good enough to bring not only necessities, but also luxuries. So that's a, uh, basically a saying there. Okay, moving on to the next, uh, Genesis 49:21. Nephetili. Nephetili is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. <laughs> when I read that, I, got, I, I, all I could think about was something that ain't very pleasant to think about. <laughs> But uh, let's see what it means. Uh, but uh, another interesting thing about Napatili, let's see where it's at. Napatili is right here. And where do you think that is? Uh, uh, who, what area do you think this might be? Put your thinking caps on. Because here's the Sea of Galilee. Uh, here's Copernicum up here. A lot of the disciples came from this area. And uh, so uh, I'll let you uh, think about that for a minute while we read the rest of this. Deuteronomy 33, 23. And of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full with the blessings of the Lord, possess thou the west and the south. Blessings of the Lord, interesting term. Some other verses about Naphtali over in Judges 4, uh, verse 6 and verse 10. And she sent and called Barak, the son of uh, Ebonai, out of uh, Kadesh Yifitai, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tamar, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali, and of the children of Zebulun? Jump into verse 10. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and he went up with ten thousand men at his feet. And Deborah went up with him. Deborah was one of the few women judges of that time. Also Judges 5, 18. Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeopardized, uh, jeopard, jeopard, how do you pronounce that word? Jeopardized their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. Some Psalms over in Psalms 18, 33 and 34. He maketh my feet like hind's feet and setteth, my, and setteth me upon my high places. He teaches my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. And Matthew 4, 12 through 16. This is probably going to give you a really good clue about what's so good about Napatili. Now, when Jesus has heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zeph Zebulun and Napatilium. 
This is the area Jesus was from. Uh, so that's what I was getting, getting at. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Elias the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Uh, light is always associated with Jesus. So you see, it was dark at one point, was full of Gentiles, uh, worshippers of uh, idols, most likely. And it, uh, the shadow of death, light has sprung up. So it's a kind of indication that the Lord is going to come from this area. And he giveth goodly words because so much of the ministry of Jesus took place in the region of Nacatilly. This was a uh, fittingly said of him. So looking back at that particular prophecy in verse 21 there. Nacatilly is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. So you can see where that comes from. Okay. So next, we'll be to verse 22. Here we're going to talk about Joseph. Now, this is going to be the big one for this particular time. Joseph, you know, is the one that's uh, actually going to receive most of the blessings when it comes to uh, what Jacob has to say. Joseph is a fruitful borough, even a fruitful borough by a wall whose branches run over the wall. I'm going to read through these few of these verses and then go back and look over them again. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Even by the God of thy father who shall keep thee and by the almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast and of the womb. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my prognate, prognators unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate, separated from his brethren. Okay, let's take, take a look at uh, Joseph here. Virgin uh, comments about this particular uh, portion. Joseph was a fruitful borough. Uh, what a testimony. Spurgeon says of this passage, the main point in Joseph's character was that he was in clear and constant fellowship with God. Therefore, God blessed him greatly. He lived to God and was a God's servant uh, and was God's servant. He lived with God and was God's child. That was uh, Charles Spurgeon said that. And I couldn't I couldn't agree anymore that uh, Joseph was just a man, a man's man. Uh, he never let things get to him. Uh, he always kind of rebounded. Uh, so that, uh, he really set his eyes on the Lord and didn't let the things around him cause him to uh, take his eyes off the Lord. Joseph, as we have seen, even under constant strife, has always maintained a dignity about him. That speaks volumes of his character and his love for God. We could all we could all take an example from him. So let's take a look at some of these verses. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. So let's get some parallel verses to this. It's kind of indicating that uh, it seems like everybody was against him at first. So Psalm 64, 3. Who wet their tongue like a sword and bent their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words. Talking about, you know, the, the coat of many colors and they wanted to eliminate him and all that kind of stuff. Even when he got into the Pharaoh and he, uh, he helped the one guy out in prison and he, and he forgot all about him for, for the three years. Okay, Psalm 118, 13. Thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord help me. But the Lord always had his uh, hand on him. John 16, 33. These things I have spoken, this is Jesus speaking. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Acts 14, 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. So, so important, uh, just like Joseph, to set our eyes on the future. And that's wonderful world we're going to be in when we get to uh, 
get in the Lord's presence and uh, uh, during the uh, once we get into the Millennium Kingdom and all that. Uh, so set your sights on that rather than the strife of today. I know that's what I try to think about. Okay, jump into verse 24. Let's take a look at this. But his bow ab abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. So yes, God was definitely uh, watching out for him. And whenever uh, a situation uh, seemed to be turning worse, God stepped in and helped him out. And look how well he made out in, in, uh, in Pharaoh's court. We're talking about his bow, uh, in Nehemiah 6, 9. For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work that had to be done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Psalms 27, 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 28, 8. The Lord is thy strength, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. Colossians 1.11, strengthening with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. 2 Timothy 4.17, notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that, my, that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. That was Paul talking. There's no direct reference of uh, what, when that happened. But it seems at one point that he was actually put in front of lions and, and survived. And also the comment in verse 24 here about uh, we're made. <clears throat> we're made strong by the hands of the mighty God. So some verses on that over in Job 29, 20. My glory was fresh in me and my bow was renewed in my hand. Psalm 18, 32-35. It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet and settleth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by my arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation and thy right hand hath holden me up. And the gentleness hath made me great. Okay, talking about Psalm 44, 7. But thou hast saved us from our enemies and hast put them to shame that hated us. Ain't that the truth? Look at how God, uh, you know, the brothers kind of uh, had a different idea about him, but uh, God had a different, uh, better idea. Okay, back to Genesis 49, 26. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my prognators unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of his head of him that was separated from his brethren. So the mighty. Let me take a look at. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure why that verse is there. Tell you the truth. Because actually, I was supposed to read verse 24 again. That verse is out of place. Verse 24, talking about the mighty uh, God of Jacob. Over in Exodus 3, 6, Moby said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God, the mighty God. Also mentions the other shepherd. From thence is the shepherd. So talking about the portion there, about the shepherd in Numbers 27, 16 through 18. Let the Lord thy God, a spirit of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them and which may go in before them and which may lead them out and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be, be not as sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man whom is the spirit, and lay thy hand upon him. Joshua was an, uh, another one that got the same, but you can see that J Joseph also had the same parallel that he was given the uh, authority by God to lead and to be able to lead uh, people out of the famine as not only the nation of Egypt, the all the surrounding nations also. 
plus his family. I also mentioned, mentioned a stone. Speaking of Jesus Christ, We see it there at the end, the stone of Israel. So uh, I got some verses out of, out of uh, order here. Let me see where I messed up here. Talking about being made, I was looking at Job 29.20 here. For some reason, I got some things out of order. My glory was fresh in me, and my bow was renewed in my hand. That's one I wrote these already. Psalm 18.32-35. through Is God that girdeth me with strength, and maketh my way perfect? He maketh my feet like hind feet and setteth me upon high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that the bow of steel is broken in my arm. Yeah, I wrote this, read these already. Okay, somehow I jumped out of place here. Get back to where I was. Okay, here we are. So talking about the stone, and the stone there is talking about Jesus Christ. That was in, uh, going, look, going back on here, the stone of Israel. That's talking about Jesus Christ. And Deuteronomy 32, 4, he is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and, and without iniquity, just and right is he. Psalm 118, 22, the stone which the builders refuse is become the headstone of the corner famous verse. That's repeated by some uh, others as we get into the New Testament. Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Let me explain this whole thing too, just in case there's anyone out there that really don't understand these stones because it, uh, some like to use this reference to try to say that uh, Peter uh, was a stone. His name actually means stones, but it's talking about small stones. And the rock we're talking about here of Jesus Christ is a chief cornerstone or the main stone. This gets it really gets confusing because the Catholics try to use it to uh, say that Peter was the first pope because of something Jesus told him or Jesus said in his presence. And so I just want to kind of mention for a minute what Jesus is kind of referring to when he gets into the New Testament is that he's the chief cornerstone, but they want to throw him away. Uh, they don't realize that he is the he is the Messiah, the chief cornerstone. And that the 12 tribes and the 12 uh, apostles were actually the foundation stones that were aligned. So if you ever think about a foundation of a house, first you start off with the uh, foundation. You always have the chief cornerstone. That's the that's the corner. Typically, on most buildings, it's the front left corner is the chief corner, and everything else is aligned with that. Uh, so you build the foundation. That's the twelve uh, apostles, and you finish building the foundation. That's the early church fathers, and we all are included in that as part of the structure. So as the church is being built, upper and upper and upper upper floors, more floors and more floors, that. Uh, uh, we keep adding to the building, but the chief cornerstone is the beginning, and that was Jesus Christ, and we're all built on top of him. So that's the whole idea they're driving, uh, they're driving at here. If that's never been, it took me a while for me to understand that. For years, I didn't know that, so I always wanted to pass that on in case if someone uh, really hasn't heard that before. They're going into the New Testament, Matthew 21, 42, speaking of Jesus. Jesus said unto them, did you never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become head of the corner. See here, Jesus is commenting about himself. 
the stone the builders rejected. The builders here we're talking about is the nation of Israel. They rejected Jesus. And now he's going to become the, uh, the cornerstone of the church. This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. Also Mark 12.10. And have you not read the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner? Luke 20, 17. These are all Jesus talking. And he beheld him and said, what is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. So there's three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke that all witness this particular comment by Jesus. Acts 4, 11. This is the stone which was set and not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. I believe that was uh, Paul or John talking uh, when they were given the, uh, some of the first sermons up there in Israel. Ephesians 2.20. And I built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Now, this is what we're talking about. You got the chief corner. Now you got the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 8. To whom coming is also under a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. He also, our living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, behold, I lay a, in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same has become the head of the corner. And the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So I know we got a little off there, when it died, but I really wanted to talk about that stone for a minute and realize that, that that's what that uh, verse was referring to as Jesus Christ way back in uh, Genesis before he was even thought of being born yet. <laughs> so for Joseph, nothing but blessing, but his son's descendants will not do as well. <laughs> That's true. Let's see what happened. We're on 24. I guess that's, I see what happened. Some verses actually got moved out of place. Somehow. Okay. I think I got to put back in here. So going back to chapter 49, and we're pretty much done there with the, uh, with the uh, we got one more to go, and that's Benjamin. We'll get to him in a second. Even by, even by the God of thy father who shall heap thee, and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth underneath, blessings of the breasts and of the women. But now jumping to verse 26. And the blessings of thy father have prevailed among the blessings of my pro progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of his head, and of him that was separated from his brethren. So Gabriel McGee has a comment on this verse that I, uh, I made note of. Uh, note that jo Jacob is trying to tie Joseph and the two tribes, which will come from him, back to God of Israel. The creator, the redeemer. Why? Well, these tribes, especially Ephraim, led Israel into idolatry. Jeroboam, who led in the rebellion and placed the two golden calves at Israel's borders, came from the tribe of Ephraim. So here on his deathbed, Jacob calls them back, back to, to the God of their father. Under verse 27. 
And Benjamin shall, uh, shall raven as a wolf in the morning. He shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. But Benjamin hears what McGee says of this passage. This is a strange prophecy concerning Benjamin. Benjamin was closely identified with Judah. You see, Benjamin is actually the area, speaking of this, Ephraim also. Here's Jerusalem. So these tribes are actually all in around uh, uh, Jerusalem. Uh, Judah being the one, that the main one uh, that, that Jerusalem was in, and that's where Jesus was born out of. But you also have Benjamin and Ephraim. And that's what uh, uh, Jacob is kind of concentrating on here. Benjamin here is what McGee says of this passage. This is a strange prophecy concerning Benjamin. Benjamin was closely identified with Judah, so much so that Benjamin went with the tribe of Judah at the division of the kingdom. The tribe of Benjamin was the only one that stayed with the house of David. Of no, Paul was a Benjamite, uh, as a matter of fact. And uh, that's mentioned over in Philippians 3, 5. This is Paul talking about himself. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Uh, so that uh, so Benjamin is a ravenous, uh, let me read first. I read verse 27. Yeah, ravenous wool, wolf. In the morning he shall devour thy prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. The ravenous group, this was, this was the tribe with a reputation for fierceness. Uh, he shall devour the prey. To see the great extent of this, look at uh, Ehud. Uh, going into Judges now. How's our time looking? Oh, I'm way over. That's a, a long way to go. Okay, we're going to stop here. That's what I thought it was end up being. Let's finish Benjamin tomorrow. Yeah, because there's uh, quite a bit to talk about here. I right, don't so think I completely finished. Uh, Got to review my notes because I don't think we completely finished with Ephraim either. Okay, so I'm going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank you, Father, so much uh, for this time. We got to look in your word. And thank you, Lord, for all the things that you've helped us to understand. And you continue to help us understand. Uh, learning so much about the, uh, the starting of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Jewish nation and all the different players involved and how they uh, all came together to make such an uh, interesting time for us to learn about your future plans. We give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I will talk to you again tomorrow and we'll finish up this chapter for sure tomorrow. <laughs> I'm kind of glad it's working out this way because I figured that uh, when I can make a nice fresh start next week on Exodus. And so we'll finish this week and spend it uh, here finishing up uh, with uh, Genesis. So have a great day and we will talk again tomorrow.